And hello. I want to uh, welcome everybody who's here. I want to welcome the regular Tuesday night Schiffer Circle doulas, as well as the folks who are joining us for this wonderful presentation by one of our senior doulas, Jessalyn Valerano. Um, Oakland Go to Birth Foundation is very proud to present this sort of lovely material for birthing people, people thinking about being birthing people, people who take care of birthing people. <laughs> we want to make sure that the most excellent and well thought out and well presented information is available for all folks who are thinking about what family might mean to them <clears throat> and how they might want to do that in their life. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Morgan, if I didn't say it earlier, I'm Executive Director of uh, Open Better Birth Foundation. And again, I welcome you, and I turn the time over to our presenter, Jessalyn Valerano. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Samsara, for having us and hosting, and thank you everyone who could show up tonight. And I hope you can thank yourself for coming tonight because whether you, again, are supporting someone in pregnancy or thinking about pregnancy in the future for yourself, or maybe you've already had children. Um, I think I speak for a lot of people in our circle of doulas in our community when I say that reproductive health is human health. And so just by showing up today, you're offering yourself a perspective on how you might thrive, whether or not you choose or are able to reproduce or reproduce in the ways we'll talk about today. Um, so my goal is to start filling in the gaps. Uh, if you're like most Americans, you probably got some pretty mediocre sex education that ended with something around don't get pregnant. Or if you get pregnant, we're gonna have you practice with this two liter bottle full of sand for two weeks. And that's gonna approximate what it's like to actually have a baby. <laughs> so most of us haven't received really excellent um, sex ed, let alone the continuation of sex ed, which includes reproduction, conception, pregnancy, loss of pregnancy, birth, postpartum recovery, breastfeeding and parenting. So that's all in there. We don't, most of us don't get that. So when we, when I started working with Samsara about, I don't know, five, five-ish years ago, we always kept coming back to, oh, there's so much to, to give people in the short amount of time that we have with them as doulas and educators. And um, so this, this class, this childbirth ed for not yet pregnant people or the pre-prenatal is really designed to kind of give people a prime. of transformation on mental, emotional, and spiritual levels. And then physiologically, it's just easier to learn certain kinds of information when we're not pregnant. Because when we are pregnant, our body is really smart and it takes all of our energy and it reprioritizes it to focus on growing another human being. Um, so I hope I get to demystify a little bit about birth. We're really gonna actually kind of back up from even talking about birth and look at uh, the different kinds of care that people can receive in the United States, the different kinds of places that people can uh, receive that care and have their babies. Um, we'll also just be taking a look at nutrition because again, pregnancy health is whole human health. Um, and I also just wanna give the caveat that uh, even as somebody who's been studying birth since 2010, and I'm sure my fellow doulas and educators here agree, there's always more to learn every day. I am blown away by the amount of both experiential information, like women's stories, parents' stories, um, other birth workers' stories, but also the amount of research and science that we're starting to get a little better at in some ways. And so there's really new information all the time, but there's also just so much already existing between cultures, between different individuals' experiences, that there's always more to learn. So you won't learn everything you could possibly learn about birth or breastfeeding today. Um, I haven't learned everything I could in the last 10 years. And that's one of the reasons that we are such big proponents of working with a doula 
uh, preferably before you even get pregnant, uh, but especially during your reproductive process, because what people need to hear and what people need to know is different from family to family. And while there, there's some topics we're gonna to cover today that I really think everyone benefits from, you might have unique questions or concerns or health histories or strengths or cultural experiences or desires that lead you to other questions and, and seeking out other kinds of knowledge. And a doula is somebody who can help you find those answers or at least help you uh, in your process of getting some more clarity and information. So that being said, we're gonna jump right into it. Um, I mentioned, please be on video if you can. If you can't, it's okay. And we're definitely gonna take a pee break. <laughs> um, I just wanna thank again, so sorry, the Oakland Better Birth Foundation. Uh, we do a lot of events just like this one, but also covering breastfeeding, infant mortality awareness, lots of workshops for black family health and resiliency in a systemically racist and uh, depleted system for healthcare. We also do workshops for other birth workers. We have guest speakers and trainers. We do doula trainings. We have scholarships. We also offer services to families specifically in Oakland and we have um, access for low or no income families and families of color in Oakland who might not be able to get doulas otherwise. So if you're interested in that or any of these, please go to our Facebook page for All Babies Better Births. Um, go to NiaOaklandBetterBirthFoundation.com or reach out to any of the circle members who are here on this meeting today. You can also find me on Facebook or little pee break. I'm going to call it a pee break because that's what it is. One of the first things I've learned in midwifery uh, or listening to midwives and, and women is to listen to your body's cues. So that's a good lesson for pregnancy, but also before pregnancy. If you need to get up, if you need to eat, if you need to drink water, please do those things. Uh, then we'll move on to some labor education. It won't be the most extensive labor education, but we're going to definitely talk about what it is. Um, some of the common myths and fears that people come across, and then a little bit more about doulas and, and getting support. So, nutrition. Everyone has probably heard some version of this quote, let thy food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food, and that's from Hi Hippocrates, who is considered the father of Western medicine through the Greeks. Um, this was in 400 BC. Ironically, even though some of the very um, first Western thinkers around healing that were written down talked about food, and I'm sure Hippocrates knew lots of midwives, uh, we don't really have much training for physicians these days when it comes to nutrition. So anyone who's a medical care provider has to kind of go outside of medical school to get the information that might help their clients in terms of preventative health. Um, Midwifery is a practice, and we'll talk more about midwives in a little bit, that actively facilitates nutrition for women's reproductive health and for, for whole life health. And that's a very big distinction between some of the different types of care we're going to talk about. Um, the reason we're talking about it today is because certainly in pregnancy, nutrition is elemental. Um, it's a huge component of preventing some of the most common complications that people do face in pregnancy in the United States, but it's also elemental to your health today, whether you're planning to be pregnant or not. And so often we just think of nutrition in terms of diet or weight loss or fitness. Um, when I think about nutrition, I'm really thinking about nourishment. So am I getting the full range of vitamins and minerals and different kinds of proteins and enzymes that my body needs, not only to like build muscle, but to build my hormones, to repair and maintain my organs, uh, to facilitate healthy waste elimination and, and liver function. Um, there's so much that goes into this from, from the bones all the way to the nerve endings and all of that is built by what we eat. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about how we frame nutrition for pregnancy and how this can be applicable to you today, whether you're pregnant or not. 
Um, for some context, in the United States, when we document maternal mortality, so the numbers that we capture in public health, looks like 700 women dying each year due to complications related to pregnancy. And at least 60% of those, or three out of five of those women, um, four and, 420. Just giving you some time. <laughs> 420 sure of those deaths. Please mute yourself if you're not on mute. 420 of those deaths are preventable. So of the 700 people who pass due to some kind of complication around their pregnancy, over half of those could be prevented because those, those preventable conditions like heart disease, um, severe diabetes, um, severe hypertension, hemorrhage, those are all related very often and, and in most cases to existing health status. Again, reproductive health is life health. And unfortunately, we live in, again, a system that's very disjointed where we might learn about something at one point and then we don't get any support for it until we're in the midst of what could be a crisis. And so that's another reason that we're so focused on nutrition. We teach a model of nutrition called five finger eating. It's a handy little trick to remember because it fits on about five fingers. It fits on your palm. Um, a palm is about a serving size. And we'll go through these different categories. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to show you what we show a pregnant person. I'm also going to just reframe it for those of you who aren't pregnant. Um, this was developed by a midwife and it's handy because it's right there on your hand. It's ha -ha, handy. And, and for you, your palm size is about a serving size. And you're aiming for at least one serving of each of these five categories at each meal. Now, I know that not everyone eats three meals a day um, in a traditional way. So snacks count, snacks are included. We'll kind of do a walkthrough exercise to show how you can get at least three of the five fingers at least three times a day, whether it's in three square meals or not. Protein's a really big one. Uh, again, we always think of like muscles when we talk about protein, but it's absolutely huge for a pregnant person's diet as well as uh, any human. Um, it's gonna build in the ba baby's case, the placenta, the umbilical cord, the amniotic sac, also the hormones, also the neurotransmitters, also other organs in the baby's body, including their muscles, but, but other parts of them too. Um, and then for the mom and for, for someone who's not, uh, currently pregnant right now, it's also building their organs, their hormones, their neurotransmitters. For a pregnant person, they're aiming for 100 grams of protein a day. That's actually not as much as it sounds. So meat, fish, eggs, beans, nuts, all of these different kinds of familiar proteins count. So do combined proteins, like when you eat uh, peas and corn and brown rice, um, legumes. So sometimes you're getting protein from like a meat or a fish. Sometimes you're getting it from something like uh, tofu or nuts, and then other times you're getting it from combinations of foods. But for just a quick example, uh, a chicken breast is about 30 or 35 grams. So if you think about that one chicken breast being about 30 grams and a pregnant person aiming for about 100, it's actually not that hard to get to 100 grams in a day. Um, for a non-pregnant person, depending on your size and your activity level and your body build, you might be aiming for somewhere between like 40 and 80 grams in a day. Green leafy vegetables. Uh, we just planted a bunch of lettuce in the back. I don't know about you, but I'm a big fan of my green leafies. They get a, a, a bad rap in fast food, uh, but that's ironic because they're actually like the powerhouse nutritional source for almost all the vitamins and minerals that you need including folic acid. Um, there is good research to show that supplementing with folic acid um, prevents certain tube defects in neural in, in development. But one of the reasons that the United States uh, has deficiency in vitamins and minerals and why Americans are often depleted in folic acid and vitamin D is because our soil is depleted and our food system is such that a lot of food loses nutritional value in the process of monoculture, refrigeration, trucking across the country, and then being chilled. Um, I take it on. That's wrong. That's wrong. Um, that was a huge task. But this is really good. Uh, the Brazilian black bean is huge, right? And, uh, and this um, so, 
food on the way to our plates sometimes loses some of its value in terms of vitamins and minerals. It's still our, our main source and we want, really want to focus on getting as much local and fresh as possible when possible. But even if that's not possible, uh, these green leafy vegetables are going to have calcium, magnesium, iron. Um, these, are, these are essential for blood health, for immune function, our cellular processes that prevent us from getting sick. Um, even the way that we breathe and our, our respiratory function, as well as um, having anti-cancer proper properties. Uh, there's lots of examples, some here are listed. So if, you know, if ever you're like, I don't even know where to start, um, again, a doula, but also um, coming to some of our other events or talking to even just a friend who has a little bit more experience with nutrition can help you get on the right track. Broccoli is one of my favorites. You'll see here also kale, spinach, watercress, cabbages, mustard greens, uh, arugula. There's so many. Um, and these are these are things that can be incorporated, of course, into any any kind of meal. Here's just another. Protein, I said uh, leafy greens, I'm not whole grains now. When I say whole grains, I mean a grain that hasn't had its parts stripped off. So we're talking about like brown rice instead of white rice. These are full of energy and they're long-term slow burning energy. They also have, ironically, you kind of think of whole grains as carbohydrates, but they also have proteins, iron, fiber, vitamins, B-complex vitamins if we're looking at whole grains. So when you're in the grocery store, um, usually we'll say that it's a whole grain, but sometimes it doesn't. You wanna go with something that hasn't been stripped and probably has more color or bran. It has different layers of, of parts to the, to the rice bran or to the, to the capsule of food itself. So these are some of the, the best examples that are available in most grocery stores. And that's brown rice, quinoa, millet, bulgur, barley, oats. Buckwheat, amaranth, kemet, uh, kamut, spelt, rye, wheat berries, corn, and wild rice. Um, I don't know if corn actually counts on there. Um, these are also often partial proteins. So for example, quinoa has protein as well as these other elements in them. So when it's combined with something like peas, it can add to that protein intake each day. Uh, food from vitamin C is important because for one, when we get vitamins and minerals from food, it tends to be more bioavailable and our body's able to utilize it better than when we buy a synthesized version. Um, that's not to say don't ever take vitamin C. I supplement with vitamin C in addition to my nutrition to keep my immune system on point. And that's what vitamin C helps. It helps with the, with the cellular processes of the immune system. So it helps us avoid getting sick and it also helps us to get better faster. It's also related to repairing soft tissue. And, and so for a pregnant person um, or someone who's going into pregnancy, there's a lot of changes happening in the body. A lot of energy is being reprioritized. A lot of soft tissue is changing. Um, and so both for someone's comfort and resiliency and strength, and then also to protect their immune system while they're going through these big metabolic changes, vitamin C is essential. You're probably familiar with some of these uh, lots of fruits on here, um, but you can also get them from red and orange and yellow vegetables, um, and even some other ones listed here like squash. The fifth finger in five finger eating is, is water. Um, so we wrote here, think amniotic fluid. Okay, obviously a pregnant person is gonna have some amniotic fluid. They're also gonna have a, a doubling of their blood volume, um, lots of extra mucus, and that's all helping them to keep baby comfortable and regulated at the right temperature. It's also helping their, their own body to handle the changes of pregnancy and cushioning the joints and the, and the spinal cord and ligaments. Um, Water is also going to help continually filter out what we don't need and, and pass on what we do. Um, we say about eight to ten cups of water per day for really anybody, whether they're pregnant or not, leaning on the side of if you need more, have more. How do I know that? Check the color of your pee. So when we take the pee break today, if anyone wants to report back, you're welcome to. It really should be about the color of light lemon juice or light lemonade. If it's really yellow or dark, 
uh, you're probably dehydrated. If it's totally clear, well, you're in the clear, but you might have even had a little too much water. Don't worry about having too much, so much as getting enough. Um, this is a really big one. And, and I don't know about the other doulas here, but I know that we've said sometimes in the prenatal period when someone's pregnant, but not quite ready to have their baby. One of the reasons I hear back from my clients um, after the fact, oh, we went to the hospital this weekend, everything's fine, but we went to the hospital. It's because they had some kind of symptom, whether it was feeling faint or crampy or just not well, and almost nine times out of 10, if not more than that. our elimination system. It helps with our brain health and our moods and our neurotransmitters. It helps with long-term energy. And ironically, healthy fats also contribute to sustainable weight loss. Um, not that that's a goal during pregnancy, but it's good to know that you actually really need some fat in your diet. And some examples of healthy fats would be nuts, seeds, avocados, um, certain raw oils like olive or coconut, um, some, some people do really well with animal fats, other people not so much. So definitely feel out what works for you. And with that, I also just want to, again, say, you know, I think in the United States, especially for female bodied people, but really for everyone, there's so much pressure around restriction and shape and having a low percentage of body fat and appearing a certain way uh, that conveys fitness whether or not it's based on real strength and while that might reflect someone's individual goals at a given time if a baby is growing if a child is growing or if a human being is growing a baby that is not the time to be cutting out calories we need to be growing we need to be adding if we want to create if we want to grow if we want to thrive and while we might think of the baby as like okay this baby's going to be about seven or eight pounds that's not that much i shouldn't i shouldn't gain more than that um well for one the baby is not just building in weight and muscle and fat but again all those all those neurological connections all those organs all those bones all those fibers all those, um, all those chemical processes that, that rely on your nutrition, but you also are going to be gaining a whole amount of strength and expansion of your uterus. You're going to be gaining a temporary organ or the placenta and the umbilical cord, which weighs a couple pounds. Um, you're also building up your own nutrient stores because babies are smart and they've evolved to the point that if a, if a pregnant person isn't getting their own needs met and you might have heard someone say well i i ate pizza and cake my whole pregnancy and my baby just came out fine a growing fetus will pull what they need to exist from the mom's deep stores so they'll pull calcium out of your bones they will pull nutrients from your tissue and so while your baby might be okay and you might even feel fine sometimes a little bit um, there's a lot of indication that that can impact not only your pregnancy outcomes, but also your long-term recovery. And so sometimes a mom will maybe even not really notice until she's a month or two into breastfeeding and she's like, I am totally depleted and exhausted feeling. And that's because between the pregnancy and the breastfeeding, without her getting the nourishment that she needed, baby has taken pretty much everything that helps her function in a way that feels good. And we want you to feel good. So given that that's a very um, hopefully accessible view on nutrition, we're going to do a little exercise, but I just want to share a few more resources on this for those who want to explore further. Um, there's a really great podcast on an episode called Birthful. It's episode number 237, and it's about what we can and can't eat based on current food science research. And this isn't about telling people what to do. It's about more so about like safety and miscommunication. There's a lot of people thinking, I can't eat any fish. I shouldn't have lettuce because it, I mean, right now there is a lettuce recall, but <laughs> I shouldn't eat lettuce because it's, it's dangerous. Um, 
I can't trust this kind of food. I shouldn't ever have any eggs that are runny even just a little bit. There's a lot of that kind of pressure to not eat certain foods when someone's pregnant. And I love this podcast because she really demystifies a lot of that false information and brings it back to trust in a pregnant person's instincts. A pregnant person has an increased level of body awareness because of the way their hormones are activating in their central nervous system. They also have an increased sense of smell. And so they are designed by evolution, by God, to, if they notice that a food is funky, even if they're not conscious, and for their body and for their own taste. Sometimes a little guidance and support is, is helpful. Um, but if you're worried about food safety or certain kinds of foods and whether they're okay for pregnancy, this is a great podcast to listen to. Um, I also really recommend exploring your own cultural foods or, or traditional pregnancy foods as well as postpartum recovery foods. You might not even realize that they're pregnancy or postpartum foods. They might just be a family recipe. Um, but often enough, those have ties both to helping us to feel relaxed and feel at home and feel a fami feel familiarity with our body, um, but also have ingredients that are in alignment with five finger eating. I want to highlight and shout out our sister uh, organization because it, uh, it's run by an integrative nutritionist named Andrea Sonford, and she uh, runs the Better Birth Association of Harlem, New York. Integrative nutritionists like Zandrea are skilled at helping somebody look at what's on their plate, what's in their fridge, what their lifestyle is like, what their budget is, and pulling that all together into a way that they can get their needs met on a regular basis without it. can be really valuable um, and self-assessment so when it comes down to it I don't know about you but sometimes I think I'm eating really well and I'm not or in the other direction I might think I haven't been doing that great and then realize you know I actually cooked for myself the last four nights in a row and I'm actually doing pretty great so in the in that spirit we're gonna do just a little quick demonstration and I'm gonna show you the food journal that we usually give our clients when they're pregnant. Um, and this is an all the time food journal through every single part of their pregnancy. We just do it for about seven days. Sometimes we do it more than once if someone's having like a lot of changes or having a hard time with their nutrition. And this is a really great way to take an honest self-assessment. So coming back to, can I really get that much protein this much time? A food journal could look like this. It doesn't have to. Can you guys, can you get a thumbs up that you guys can see this okay? Okay, great. And usually the easiest way to do a journal is at the end of the day, but you can do it throughout the day too. I'm using this as an example because I want to, again, note that not every... Don't unplug anything, Naomi. I'm in the middle of a fifth grade thing. Oh my God. Can we put it back on, please? I don't know what to do. 